All right, so two very important structures that we're going to be looking for in the spine on different in different positions projections are intervertebral foramina and zygote puffy-zeal joints. And so you'll want to know in what position are either of these things shown for any given area of the spine. Okay. Um, Notice that the cervical spine is just different than the lumbar and thoracic. Notice the lumbar and thoracic, for example, both show intervertebral foramina in the lateral projection, whereas the cervical spine does not. The cervical spine shows those structures um, in a 45-degree oblique projection. Okay? Whereas if you want to see zygopaphyseal joints, the cervical spine shows them to you on lateral, but the thoracic and lumbar show them to you when you've obliqued the patient. How much obliquity? depends on what part of the spine you're talking about, okay? More obliquity in the upper spine, less obliquity in the, in the lower spine. And two, this is, this is just another way of saying, and you could otherwise say this as 90 degree oblique, which is the same thing as saying lateral, right? So notice the angle just goes up from here, 45 to 70 to 90, right? It just so happens that we call 90 degrees oblique if it's a lateral because you've rotated the patient a full 90 degrees, but that's what the theme is, right? more rotation for the zygomaphyseal joints the further up in the spine that you go. Okay. What are intervertebral foramina? <clears throat> and um, what are they made by? What are they made from? The, the notch in the pedicle, right? The inferior notch and the superior notch. So let's go back real quick. You got it. You know, I know you, you had it, but so let's go back real quick, right? That notch, right? And that notch, this inferior notch will interlock with the next vertebra's superior notch, right? This is the intervertebral foramina, okay? Now, what's the difference between intervertebral foramina and a vertebral foramen. The foramen is a big one that's in the dead center. Good. The so one let's. That, the one that we see uh, in the superior inferior view. Like this, right? This is our vertebral foramen, this hole. That oh. is an intervertebral foramina. Okay? Vertebral foramen, hole in a vertebra. Intervertebral foramina. A hole between vertebrae, intervertebral. F O R E. For for the for foramen. Foramen. Yeah, right here. Foramina or foramen. Foramina means a hole made by more than one bone, or many holes in one bone. Okay. In this case, the word foramina is being used to mean a hole created by more than one bone. You have a bone below this that makes the inferior part of that circle, right? Okay. So, intervertebral foramina are different than a vertebral foramen. Foramen is a single hole through a single bone. Foramina describes either many holes in one bone or one hole created by more than one bone. Okay, such as this is the case for intervertebral foramina. Okay. But just to be as clear as I can, foramen is a singular word. It means one thing, right? Foramina is a plural of that same word, okay? Meaning more than one thing. Okay, and intervertebral means between vertebrae, and vertebral means of that vertebra, pertaining to that vertebra. Okay, more and more and more exposure to this is going to get it, make it easier and easier and easier. Let's look at our uh, topographic landmarks. These are palpable landmarks on the body that correspond to some level on the spine. So, uh, let's get a laser pointer. Alex, yeah. Can you go back to the, um, the circle? Which one? This one? Yeah. Cool, yeah, of course, of course. All right. So yeah, definitely, definitely study that one. Um, it's important for our lateral and oblique projections to know this stuff, uh, to know what position and what how much obliquity shows which thing. Okay, cool. All right, so let's take a look at our topographic landmarks, starting from the top. Um, 
typically, and what I prefer more than anything, is I prefer posterior positions where the patient is laying on their back, okay? Um, if you've ever had a back injury, you know it's probably more comfortable to lay on your side or your back with your knees bent than it is to lay on your stomach, okay? Laying on your stomach increases the, the lordotic curvature for your lumbar spine and can lead to muscle spasms, whereas laying on your back with your stomach, with your face up, um, is typically more comfortable. So in almost all cases, I, I haven't really seen many, maybe just a couple, where I would prefer to put the patient um, prone. Most of the time we put the patient supine for the um, spine projections, like we practiced last week. Um, and for that, all the bony landmarks that we need, or because of that, all the bony landmarks that we need are on the front of the body. Okay, so I like the patient in the supine position, in a posterior position, because uh, all the bony landmarks are to the front, and it's a more comfortable position for the patient. So, xiphoid tip, right, the xiphoid tip of the xiphoid process, corresponding to about thoracic vertebra 9 and 10, um, that would mean that your light field for a lumbar projection need not extend past that. Okay, that is the maximum height that your light field should reach. Okay, so when you're positioning for the lumbar spine, you found your central ray position, right? You're all centered up and happy, and you want to know how tall should my light field be and how wide should it be, right? Well, oh, thank you. Um, well, height of the light field, right, that needs to be set by where your central ray is placed. And secondly, where the xiphoid process is. You want your light field to not extend beyond the xiphoid process. Okay. All right, so xiphoid tip marks the... Uh, hang on, frozen computer. Xiphoid tip marks the superior aspect of your collimated field. Um, marking, as far as spine positions, marking thoracic spine uh, vertebra 9 and 10. Coming down to this second um, position here, this is the lower costal margin. You can palpate on the side of a patient where their ribs stop, right? The lower costal margin corresponding to about lumbar vertebra 2, maybe 3, but usually about 2. Um, that is higher than you would place your central ray but it marks, roughly speaking, the about middle of the lumbar spine, okay? Again, very roughly speaking here, it's different on everybody. Come down to um, position C. This is, a, this is uh, one of, of three of your most important ones. Your most important topographic landmarks for the, for the lumbar spine um, and the pelvis and, and sacrum and all that involves your pelvis. Okay, so topographic palpable landmarks on your pelvis are the most important. One of them that you'll get really good at figuring out where it's at is the iliac crest. Okay, the top of the pelvis, the, the top crest of the ilium. Okay, and um, it's you can find it on everybody, and this is what you find x-ray techs having to poke in real hard on people's sides to find. Yeah. I find that the ASIS is, they're both good. But the ASIS is easier for me, at least, to find on heavier people. Sure. Because, I mean, they just have more midsection, and it's really difficult to palpate the very top of the crest. Um, Poke them hard. Yeah, not to, <laughs> not to mention a lot of people are very, very ticklish. Yeah. And the more you poke at them there, I think it's less ticklish on the ASIS. Yeah, I'm going to poke them hard. <laughs> so, um, quite literally, what I will do as I position patients or go to find this is I will almost karate chop their sides, and you're doing one on doing it on both sides too. Karate chop, karate chop, karate chop, and eventually you find right there. I'm talking about your very, very large patients where you're not going to see those things. Right on smaller people, you can usually see that, and ASIS sticks out. I've had like quiet moments where you know it's a little bit embarrassing to try to ask the patients because they. You know, they, they assume that you're professional, you're, you're, well, I mean, you're professional, but they assume Safe that you're like pro at this, yeah. and you know exactly how to do things, but they don't know what we're looking for. So I find it a lot easier to ask the patient, look, I'm looking for the, your hip bone right now, and but I can't really feel it all that well. Can you do me a favor? Can you kind of show me point yeah. out where it's at? That's great. So they're going to show you, and then once you talk, like, I like to explain it to them, because for me, it's easier for me to remember and retain the information for what I'm looking for, and then I, I as a medical assistant, I just find it easier and more beneficial for a patient to leave the clinic 
like learning something sure. from their visit. About their own because body, they yeah. don't just feel like they just came in to have prescriptions pushed on them. And you know, they, like, I educate diabetics, every single one I meet, I tell them what carbohydrates are. Half of them don't know what that is. Right. So it's easier for me to explain something to them so that they leave um, learn like with them feeling like they learned something and they feel like oh going to the doctor is actually a good thing because it's it's for my health and right. they're not just telling me stuff right right i mean so part of your job is to be the medical professional doing the task and procedure right but the other part of your job is you're a patient advocate right you're a patient advocate you are there to be a patient educator right physicians do a lot of patient education but you do too that's part of your job to within your scope right educate patients and um educating them on you know where to find different parts of their body, so right? So it makes it easier for them, more comfortable, yeah. and they're just, I mean, if you make them feel comfortable, then it's just a lot easier for everything to flow, and it's easier for everything to get done, as compared to a patient that comes in with anxiety, yeah. and they're already kind of defensive, and they don't want to do certain things, or they're just uncomfortable. Exactly. A good example is the pubic symphysis, right? That, where the laser pointer is centered right now, it's A on here. The pubic symphysis is... Um, Right, right where the gen external genitalia are found on pretty much everybody, right around that area, right? So um, I'm personally not going to go palpating the pubic symphysis unless I need to, right? I, you can, definitely, with good explanation, you can. But in most cases, as Javier just said with his example, he had the patient located, right? He was talking about the iliac crest, but that's what I'll do for the pubic symphysis, right? I will have them locate and palpate that and put a finger right on it, right? And then I just use where they've placed their finger as my landmark, right? My, vis my visible landmark. Um, in other cases, I'm physically palpating the patient. I am one of those x-ray techs who does less explanation and more physical manipulation. I physically put patients into positions that I want them to go in because I know what I want and they don't know what I want, right? Um, and when you are tasked with doing this in a short time frame, sometimes explanations take longer, okay? But um, I encourage you guys to do as much as you can with patient explanation and when you need to, then physically manipulate the patient with all the while making sure that they know what's going on. There's no surprises, right? The patient should never be surprised. I, they should never go jump off the table because I poked them on their side, you know, surprisingly, right? Um, they should know, hey, you know, I'm going to poke you on your side really quick. It might be a little ticklish, and there you go, you poke them, right? Um, but yeah, patient communication, I mean, just the blanket statement of you should have good patient communication is so important. Um, exactly how to do that takes practice, but patient communication will be the best way for you to get good results with your exams. You know, you position better, they listen better um, when, we're, when we're talking and explaining and, and they're understanding what we're, what we're doing for them. Okay, that was good. So, um, iliac crest corresponding to lumbar 4 and 5. That means that to find the center of the lumbar spine, which is 3, you have to be above the iliac crest. Okay, so commonly we'll say things like place the central ray two fingers width above the iliac crest. Okay, and we'll have an actual... Um, uh, an inch measurement to give you for that, but two fingers width is a common measurement above the iliac crest to place our central ray. The ASIS, anterior superior iliac spine, corresponding to um, about S1, which is sacral uh, vertebra number one. Remember the sacrum was five individual bones that fused, right? So you can still recognize the separate pieces of them and you can call them S1 through S5. Um, ASIS corresponds to roughly the level of S1, S2. And then uh, marking the most inferior margin of the spine, the coccyx does not extend below the pubic symphysis. So the pubic symphysis can be used as a lower um, bony landmark for either locating the coccyx or finding your lower margin for where the spine stops. The spine does not extend below the pubic symphysis. So the top of the pubic symphysis will mark the lowest possible portion of the spine, at least the level of that. Okay. So we've got some bony landmarks and um, we've learned a couple things so far. Let's see how, how much you guys have retained. So, um, Shout it out if you know it. The portion of each lamina between the superior and inferior articular process is termed the what? Ooh. So where's the lamina and where's the pedicle? Are they the same structures or are they different structures? They're different. They're different structures. So we can't be B. Good. 
It's C, the pars interarticularis. Okay, pars interarticularis. Um, there are uh, such things called pars defects and pars fractures, um, which involve this area. So the lamina, the area of the lamina between the superior and inferior articular process, that that spot there, um, is subject to trauma and fracture, and so a pars fracture. I like how for us that speak Spanish, it should be a lot easier for us to understand the Latin terms. But yeah, oh, 100%. Yeah. yeah. That literally says partes interarticulares. So, I mean, it's the part between the articulations? Yeah, pars, is partes, partes interarticulares. Yeah. Interarticular parts. There you go, the interarticular part. So, yeah, if you didn't catch that already, if you speak Spanish, you should have a much, much easier time understanding medical terminology especially when it's taken from Latin root words. It's like, taken a while, like because I'm trying words. to read the word in English. And yeah. Like, then, like, one day I just had a dark moment when I was listening to Spanish music. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, it looks, it looks like Spanish. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. So, r remember, what's important is that some root words for medical terms are taken from, from Greek roots, right? Which don't have Spanish. Uh, Spanish language is taken from, from Latin roots. So, um, some words aren't, don't work like that, but a lot of them do, okay? And um, that's going to make your job a little bit easier, you know? Um, and there's a, there's a million examples. That's a really, I never really caught on to that one. That's a really good example of one. I don't speak that much Spanish, so that's why I don't, didn't catch it. Um, it's like, hello. It's in Spanish, same thing. Oh, it is. Yeah, okay, there you go. We call it the wing of the pelvis. All right, there you go. Yeah. yeah. How, oh, how, how do I? Um, I can speak enough Spanish to get through an exam. Yeah. Um, I did the uh, typical two years of Spanish in high school, right? And I didn't retain, I, I did really, really well, but then of course you don't use it, you lose it, right? So then um, once I got into x-ray, I was like, oh crap, I gotta learn Spanish. <laughs> um, and so I just picked it up as I went. Luckily I had like the base, like I know, I know how, I know grammatical structure, right? I know how words are structured in Spanish, I know how to conjugate and all that. So then I just had to learn what the words are for the different things I wanted them to do. And, um, that's easier, right? Um, but yeah, I can't, you, you can't have me go in and translate for a doctor or anything like that, but bring a Spanish-speaking patient and I can lay them down and turn them. Because I know in Salinas, you like, you like high yeah. Oh, it's 80% or more, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's expected. Um, you know, I, I did my clinical externship in Colinga and it's it's almost everyone is Spanish-speaking there, so yeah. How do you um, instruct a, a, a mute patient? Somebody who is mute and doesn't, doesn't talk? Yeah, like, because I had to do a chest x-ray. I mean, if they don't talk, can they hear? I'm not being a smart. I'm not being a smart ass. I'm asking a real question. Okay. Hmm. Um. So, wait, so mute is is not deaf. Mute is mute. Were they deaf? I think you know what. I think they might be both. Oh, that's that's harder. Um. So uh, he could see though, right? So I would give the instru I would either. Uh, physically manipulate right after you've given some instruction and, and for that I would I would turn to either written instruction I would literally write it down for them right assuming they can read right literally write it down or have the text to um, speech to text thing set up on your phone right that's well, that'd had, be my I best recommendation that was like that they were hard of hearing and they didn't talk at all yeah and I just asked them like do you read lips and yeah. Like, yes, I'm like, yeah. If they can't hear, then you got to rely on them yeah, being able well, to like, see what you're saying. Well, I mean, like, see what you're saying. Majority of them are mute. Okay. So, um, <laughs> then, then, I, then, so, so Google Translate. Uh, there's other apps too, but Google Translate will give you speech to text, so you can talk and have it translate, speak in English, right, and then have it translate into whatever language you want, text, right, and then I, they can do it like that. Um, I've had that for for some for some things. I've had people who were just absolutely hard of hearing, and so you basically essentially deaf, and either you're either writing or you're doing that text uh, speech to text thing, um, and then along with physical manipulation, like let them know that hey, you know, I'm gonna move you around, and I need you to stay where I move you by speech to text or whatever, right, and then and then physically. So um, well, it's in Spanish. Um, well, so my literal instruction in Spanish for take a deep breath and hold it is uh, respire profundo y deténgalo. That means breathe deep and hold it, as far as I know. Yeah. Um, and I know there's other ways people have said it, so, um, but yeah. So you'll need to start asking for, for like actual feet on the ground, what you do, right? You'll need to start asking the x-ray techs what the terms they use are um, and start trying to practice them. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, gown them. Sh gown, and, gown and shield. Uh, uh, sh rather, shield them is what I'm trying to say. They don't have to wear gloves and a thyroid shield, but they should wear a full apron. 
and they should stay um, behind the control booth when you're making your exposures, and they can come out between exposures. Yeah, so like, you know, with workers' comp injuries, right, um, after they're established patients, they will almost always have a translator with them if they speak Spanish, or if they speak any other language but English, they'll, they'll, the insurance company will have provided a translator for them, and that person can come to x-ray with you and be gowned up and all that. Um, yeah, so you, you got to adapt, right? You got to figure out what to, there's a way to do it, right? Um, I recall a time when I had a, a Spanish-speaking um, older lady, she was in her 80s, and she was blind and deaf, <laughs> and she could speak Spanish to you, um, but she couldn't hear me, right? Couldn't see me. Um, so it's like, you know, like Helen Keller, right? Blind and deaf, right? So you have to like literally lead them around and everywhere and, and, and you're just hoping that they trust you, right? Um, they've had to learn to be pretty trusting of people by that point, right? Um, so yeah, you're just leading. I had to do an abdominal exam, abdominal series on her, which is a series of a few images in different positions, up and down. And um, yeah, just go slow and provide a lot of hands-on support for the patient. But in the case where they can still see, I really like the speech to text. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, those are good questions. Um, okay. Uh, here we go. This is the one you guys should get. You guys should get this one by now. Another term for the wings of the sacrum is Allah. Allah. Okay. Allah. Little little wings. I didn't know he told little me wings. Allah. Okay. That's what we call them, like wings. And yeah. Then, like, you know, wings. Allah. And I'm like, oh my God. That's great. When we ask for I'm learning things. things. See, I, I've been doing this for a while, and I didn't know that Allah meant wing. So there you go. Um. Let's do, let's do this one. Uh, no, we didn't do this one yet. Uh, let's see, I like this one. Which zygopophysial joint is demonstrated in the left anterior oblique position of the lumbar spine? A. Mm-hmm, because it's opposite. Yep. So it's A on the right. You are demonstrating the opposite side zygopophysial joint when they're in the anterior oblique projection. Good. What position, so... Um, so we're demonstrating the right zygopophysial joint. What's the opposite position that would do that? Would demonstrate that same one? Yeah, exact opposite, right? So if LAO does it, then RPO also does it. And it would be the downside on, on that one. So it would be the same side. Okay. All right, let's take a, a little bit of time here to go through our positions, describe them. And um, after that, we'll take a small break and then get to positioning practice. All right, so these are positioning considerations for the entire uh, lumbar spine. Um, for one, consider gonadal shielding. So here's a rule. So this, this is a, a rule, one of, one of several radiation safety rules you have to follow. Um, you shall shield the gonads anytime they lie within five centimeters or two inches of a well collimated beam. So your light field, okay? The um, tacked on little asterisk to this is, as long as shielding the gonads does not block the anatomy you're looking at, okay? For example, in a pelvis radiograph on a female, shielding the gonads, which are internal on a female, almost always blocks part of the pelvis. Um, the radiograph of the sacrum on a female, shielding the, shielding the gonads will every time block the sacrum because that's where the gonads are, is right, where the, right in front of where the sacrum is. So you shall shield the gonads when they're within two inches of a well collimated beam unless it covers the anatomy you're looking at. And what we mean by that are uh, gonad shields. Um, what I don't mean, I don't mean a lap apron, okay? There is a difference between a lap apron and that gonad shield shown there, not only size and shape, right? There's obvious size and shape differences, but the main difference here is that that lap apron will likely only be about a quarter of a millimeter thick, 
quarter millimeter, 0.25 millimeters, whereas these gonad shields are required to be at least a half a millimeter thick. They're at least twice as thick as the lap shields are. Okay. Now, that lap shield and both of those both are a half millimeter thick, but they're not required to be so. Okay. So lap shields are typically not as thick as gonad shields, and they're not required to be as thick. Okay. Mm -hmm. Lap shields are not designed to be used in the path of the primary x-ray beam. Just so we're all on the same page, what's the primary x-ray beam? What do we mean? Central, central ray or um, so the, what the primary beam is, it, the central ray is part of it, right? The primary beam is the x-ray beam before it has interacted with the body, before it's interacted with anything. It's come out of the x-ray tube and it's coming down towards the body, okay? That hasn't been absorbed, attenuated, or filtered by anything yet, so it's the strongest, okay? These lap shields are not designed to be used in the path of the primary beam. They're not thick enough, okay? These gonad shields are. These gonad shields attenuate approximately about 80-ish percent of the primary beam um, when we're using the KVP settings that we normally set for the lumbar spine, 70 to 80 KV in that range. So they're, they're designed to pick up the scatter? Lap shields, yes. They're designed for scattered radiation. That's why we use them on chest x-rays, but not on um, uh, primary beam exposures. Yeah. So um, good. So shield the gonads when they're close to the primary beam. How close? Well, within five centimeters. Okay. Um, consider PA versus AP. Okay. Uh, either meaning, if you're thinking about it, consider putting the patient supine or prone. Okay. There's advantages to both. Let me uh, let me give you the sales pitch for um, for. Do I have it here? Well, here I'll give you the sales pitch for why. Why supine and why prone? <laughs> okay, so the sales pitch for supine is pretty straightforward. Um, patients are usually more comfortable on their back. Okay, you put them on their back, you let their knees bend, and that tends to take some of the curvature out of the lumbar spine as we bend our knees. Uh, think of think of that here, knees bend. Okay. So with the knees bent, take some of the curvature out of the lumbar spine, and you see that here. This is the same patient, legs extended versus legs um, flexed, and you notice there's a decreased curvature underneath the patient. So the back has straightened out a little bit, which is a good thing for us. Um, remember, the primary beam starts up here from the x-ray tube from a, from a tiny, teeny, tiny spot, and it spreads out like a flashlight. Like a flashlight beam spreads out. Um, and these joints, these joint spaces, right, are when the spine is, let's exaggerate the flex, when the spine is flexed like that, these joint spaces, stay, these joint spaces point like that, right, okay, but the beam points like that, okay, so the beam is not parallel to the joint spaces, okay, so flexing the knees straightens out the back and gets the joint space is closer to parallel to the beam, okay, but not perfect. So the sales pitch for this is it's comfortable for the patient, okay? The sales pitch for PA, with their face down prone, is now if you look at the curvature to the spine, now the curvature of the spine more, more better, it matches better the diverging beam, okay, the beam starting here and spreading out as it goes through space, now these joint spaces are more aligned to that, okay? That's the only good part about the PA projection, is it does a better job of demonstrating the joint spaces between the vertebrae. Um, the PA is more comfortable, and with the knees flexed, um, you can usually get rid of some of that um, issue of, of the joint spaces running opposite to where the direction the beam runs. So. There's um, goods and bads with both, PA versus AP. My recommendation almost always is AP. Medium to high KV. So um, KVP is the controlling, it's, it's an electrical setting on your machine, and it's what controls the penetrating power of the X-ray beam, how strong the X-ray beam is. A low KVP setting, gives you an x-ray beam with low energy, 
okay? A low energy x-ray beam either d does more absorbing in the body or more passing through. It, you have not a lot of in between. The beam is either absorbed or it passes through. So you get images that are relatively higher contrast where there's a lot more black and white, okay? High contrast. The higher your KVP setting is, the more energetic your x-ray beam is, and the more shades of gray you can demonstrate with that, the lower your contrast is, okay? In a chest x-ray, we used something like 100 to 120 KV, varied in, somewhere in there. We want high KV on chest x-rays because we want low contrast, many shades of gray, long gray scale, I don't care how you say it, but we want many shades of gray, right? The lumbar spine and all of the spine is somewhere in the middle. We don't want super high contrast like we get with the hands and wrists and things like that. We also don't want chest x-ray images, okay? We want somewhere in the middle. In fact, we call this middle range the optimum KVP range, and it's a, between about 70 and 80, okay? The books may vary slightly. Like if you look, um, I'm just looking on 341 at the AP projection right now of the lumbar spine, 75 to 90. Okay, this is the middle-ish range for KVP, okay? Um, and 80 kind of being the happy medium that most people sort of settle at. Um, so medium to high KVP. Source to image distance for the lumbar spine. And in fact, all of the spine except for the lateral cervical spine should be done at 40 inches. They say 40 to 46, we sort of standardize it at 40, that way we don't have to think too much. So, you know, when you do your, your fill-ins, like you're gonna do at some point today, right? Um, central ray, you say where it goes in at and how far away it starts, okay? So SID, source to image distance, is always 40 inches for the spine. In your lateral projections, you guys recall, uh, Taylor was the, the, the um, person, the, the uh, patient for this last time, right? You guys recall when I was showing you guys the thoracic spine, how I got out those lead mats for the lateral projection. So there's your lead mat laying behind the patient, right? And its job is to absorb scattered radiation, which would otherwise make its way down to the table, through the table to the image receptor, and expose and further fog the image receptor. Okay, the, what you should think of is the thicker a body part is, the more scatter that it will create. Okay, and when you turn the body into the lateral projection, the body is very thick laterally. Okay, so we want to make sure that we are um, reducing scatter by applying a lead mat behind the patient. Used for lateral projections, absorb scatter, and then tight collimation. The tighter that you collimate your light field, the less scatter that will be produced. Also take note, they put a, a sponge underneath the patient to support the hips. Let's see if I can find a better picture for that. Um, anytime the patient ha is, uh, has a narrow um, true waist, uh, their true waist is narrower by a lot than their hips and shoulders are, there's going to be a gap here. And if you don't use the sponge underneath the patient, the patient's spine tends to sag. Okay. And we want to make sure that spine is as straight as possible, as, is, um, as it is when the patient is standing up. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about each projection now. So the AP of the lumbar spine, let me pause and restart the...